I am Maester Alex, and this is Shadowrun Returns Dragonfall. We're right back where we left off here in our base in the Kurtz Bazaar. Alright, so before we get going, I realized I have a lot of karma to spend, so let's spend it. So, back to Intelligent. No, wait. Wisdom. So, more spellcasting. And that's just about it. Two more points so we can uh, raise that, uh, raise it higher. So there we go. Ah, I, do, I do can greetings. Amsel peers through a battered old pair of wiring glasses. There's something gentle about the man. With his silver hair and tweed jacket, he looks more like an aging art history professor than he does a criminal go-between. What can I do for you? Let's see. Actually, Paul, nothing. That's right. We have to take the U-Bond somewhere. No, no. Sorry. Don't need anything, sorry to bother you. Right. We were going to... I believe we had a new disc to listen to, yes? Nope, power it down. Now let's go talk to our friends, see what they have to say, what they think. I do, Duken, what can I do for you? Any thoughts on our last run? I'm not gonna lie, Duken. That one was gonna stick with me for a while. What they did to that troll was sick. On paper, you did everything right. We did our job to the letter, the client got paid, and everyone went home happy. But between you and me, I wish we could have put that poor creature down. The Mark Six was a real live person once, just like you and me. We handed him over to Herr Schmidt like a piece of merchandise. This one's gonna sit with me for a while. Mm. Do you trust me? She paused for a moment, considering finally she nods. Yeah. Yeah, I do. You've earned that much. But I have always agreed with your decisions, I Dukin, but you've proven your competence. It's only fair for me to acknowledge it. Then tell me what happened to your team. This again, why do you even care? Because it was pretty clear if you had your way, you'd still be with them. A good leader paces, places priority announcing. Doesn't matter, I'm your team leader. I'm asking you a question. I'd like your answer to it. Yeah. All right, I'll tell you. I suppose you deserve to know. What happened to us was Hoffman. He was a rookie. The kind of big, uh, the big money corporate execs. He looked good on paper. He made it through KSK training, so he was technically qualified to join the team, but he was way too green to fit with ours. Still, he wanted to be a hero, and his family had enough clout to get him in an assignment of his choosing. I don't know how many strings Hoffman's daddy had to pull to get him assigned to our team, but he pulled them, and Hoffman, because he's our ninth squad mate, despite Metzger's objection. Anyway, flash forward a few weeks, we're closing in on the Russian mob's major traffic operations. They've been using a series of warehouses 50 miles from the border as a staging area for their convoys. Women and girls from the Eastern Europe were being housed there. When the convoys came, they'd be crammed into cargo containers and hauled across the border into Germany. Go to the uh, go to any brothel along the border, have a look around. Chances are you'll find at least a few girls who spent some time in those warehouses. Slovakians, Hungarians, Poles, you name it. The mob had been smuggling them over for decades. But we were in a position to derail their operation, and we were going to let our new addition when we were were not going to let our new addition slow us down. We hit them by surprise, and we hit them hard. Fisher and Braun managed to take down the Banshee that had they had patrolling the site. Wolf had reconnaissance drones overhead providing battle tech feeds to the rest of us, and we picked off their gunmen one by one. They had numbers on us, but they didn't know where to hit us. We had eyes in the sky, we had cover and concealment. Every time they thought they had a fix on us, we'd shift positions and hit them again. They might as well have been fighting ghosts. Then Hoffman broke cover and gave away our position. After that, all hell break loose. Wolf went down first. The sound of it will haunt me for the rest of my days. The explosion, the choke scream, and this long, drawn-out gurgling sound. When he died, his drones went down with him, and there were too many hostiles to track without them. I'll spare you the gory details, I do can suffice to say my team was wiped out. Her face clouds again. You can see the tears begin to well up in her eyes. I watched Metzger die. With a visible effort, she clamps down in her emotions and calms herself. When she speaks again, her voice is flat. I took three rounds myself. 
had to drag myself back across the Oderness line into Germany. I almost died. And that's the story. My KSK career died with the rest of our team. Our mission was illegal, after all. Off the books. There was no going back for me, so I wound up here. She looks you in the eye, her tone impassive. Did that tell you everything you wanted to know, fearless leader? Are you satisfied now? Yes. Thank you, Iger. So tell me, what's your takeaway from my tale of woe? Figure you've got that you've got to have one. Uh, let's see. When Monica died, you blame me because I was new to the team, but I'm not Hoffman. You're hung up on your past error and want you to survive in the shadows. You have to get over it, or it doesn't matter what I think, what you think, and how you react on it. That's what's important. Just pause to consider. Normally, I call that a cop-out answer, but I guess that's uh, there's some truth to it. In any case, you don't need to worry about me, fearless leader. My baggage isn't going to hurt my job performance or anything. You might be thinking I judge you too harshly in the beginning because of Hoffman. You'd be right on that count. I probably did. But everything else I said after Monica died was justified, whether you want to believe it or not. Giving command of this team was a hasty decision, and for the wrong reasons. I stand by that assessment. But between then and now, I've watched and I've been watching you like a hawk, and you have grown, I do can. You weren't right choice to leave before, I still believe that. But you are now. Thanks, Iger. Good talk. Till next time. Right, let's go talk to Glory, if she's willing. Glory's pale face lights up as you approach, a genuine smile across her lip. Adukin, good to see you. You too, Glory. How are things with you? Pause for a moment. You know, I'm happy, actually, for the first time in a long time. I have you to thank for that. Any thoughts on the last run? A tinge of red crawls up Glory's neck. I do can look at me. She extends her sculpted metal arms. Chrome, chrome glitz in the flickering. I'm, I'm not far from being what that poor troll was. When I think of what they did to him, she looks in the eye, transfixes with your, transfixes you with your gaze. You handed him over, I do can, like a piece of merchandise, like a thing. We shouldn't have done that. I should have stopped you, but I didn't, and I don't like what it says about me. Uh, uh, are you ready to tell me about the chrome you're sporting? Be patient, I dukin. The explanation for that is coming. A look of unease across her face. I'm not sure you're going to like it, though. You needed time. I gave you time. Are you ready to talk about your friend yet? Yeah. She looks troubled, more so than you've ever seen her before. Whatever memory she's dragging up must have been exceedingly painful. I'm not going to lie. I haven't been looking forward to this. But yeah, it's time. I do can look. I'm about to tell you some things about myself that might change your opinion of me. It's entirely possible that you're going to hate me based on what's coming up next. I've accepted that, and if that's what happens, I sincerely believe that I deserve it. She looks in the eye and experting ground. So tell me, are you sure you want to keep pushing forward with me? It's important for you, Glory. After everything we've been through, I think I, that we both know that whatever you have to tell me, I'm ready to listen. Uh, yes. Thanks, Adukin. Thanks for being a friend. So when we left off last time, I just moved from the streets of Turbin to the warm, inviting confines of Fürstel. Marta and I were happy there for a little while, and Haro embraced us, me as a long-lost daughter. I should have probably took take a moment to talk about Haro. He's going to be an important figure in the story. I don't know what age he was. He seemed old enough to be paternal, but young enough to to hang with kids or something like a peer level. But I guess I'd say he was mid-twenties. He was handsome and well-built, and nearly and a neatly trimmed beard with thick brown hair. There was something else about him, something uncanny. Haro had this charisma, this raw, magnetic attraction that just made people latch onto him. I saw it over and over. All it took was a few words and a pat on the shoulder, and Haro would have a new convert. The kids at the farm followed him around like lost puppies. As much as I loved Marta, and as much as I thought she loved me, we forgot all about one another when Haro was around. All that we wanted was to be close to him, part of his inner circle, and soon enough we were. For a girl of seventeen, it was all terribly exciting. Haro had these rules of living, and he would teach us. Rules about self-determination and, and the importance of disobedience. He claimed to have taught classes at the University of Berlin, 
which he uh, painted as a mix between earthly paradise and an anarchist playground. He told us how Verstel would be the focal point of a new movement for the children of the fatherland. He told us we were special. We ate it up, of course. We were kids. For those at the inner sanctum, Haro would share even more. He had power like of which the likes I had never seen. Not my father's drunken fists or my own childish experiments, but genuine, incredible power. He said it came from the horned god, an ancient deity that he venerated. He knew about my latent abilities right away, and he offered to teach me. Naturally, I accepted. Oh. Can't blame you. In your position, I would have done exactly the same thing. Well, that's comforting to hear. I'm glad to know that someone as competent as you to make an abysmal mess of her life as I did. Glory sighs. Hang with me, Duke, and rough waters ahead. So I became Haro's apprentice. He taught me to channel magic and summon spirits. He taught me rituals and pagan traditions, Machiavellian philosophy, and Nietzschean ethics. Above all, he taught me to connect with the Horned God, and through it I learned power and arrogance, and it was all downhill from there. For the next few years, I lived at Verstel as Haro's enforcer, right-hand girl. I was also his sometimes wife concubine, but that was a distinction that I shared with all the distinction I shared with all the girls of the commune, including my beloved Marta. I came to learn that she's been his long before she met me, and by that point I didn't care. I'd embraced the rules of living with Haro's creature through and through. I, d I didn't ask questions, I walked the path that was in front of me. Other fun facts about those years, I learned cruelty. I had power now, and my new idol encouraged me to use it. Haro did the same. Any children who didn't pull their weight were subjected to my tender mercies, and I was anything but tender. I took what I wanted rather than asking for it. I liked it. It was fun. I also came to learn that Haro's horned god was not the icon first worshipped by a throwback cult across Germany. It was certainly a god with horns that came from an altogether different tradition. Care to hazard a guess? Educate me. Satan. Lucifer. Old Scratch. And the magically active community refer to it as the adversary. Whatever you choose to call it, it's every bit as bad as it sounds. So my idol, the ancient deity that was feeding me in my power, was the antithesis of everything my right of everything that's right and good. And you know what? I didn't care. In our time together, Haro and I committed more atrocities than I can count. At this point, I was onto all of his tricks. I knew that uh, Firstel was nothing more than a honey trap, carefully designed to lure local children to my master's clutches. I knew the kids who were who seemed restrained to Haro's brainwashing techniques wound up fertilizing the garden. I knew that Haro's entire manifesto was bullshit. I knew through I saw I knew that through it all, Haro and the adversary were laughing because I was laughing right there beside them. I didn't want to pin the blame on my uh, for my decisions on anyone but me. That said, I would like to point that my father's connection to the Kurtzritters might have helped me play into my willingness to serve the adversary my warped indoc indoctrinated little brain I equated the church with evil so the opposite with that so I figured it had to be well if not good at least not totally bad but I was kidding myself of course my new deity was every definition of bad serving it, it made me bad end of story <sighs> again I disagree with you glory I don't think any of this was your fault Haro is the one who deserves the blame And if he was indoctrinated in the service of the adversary when he was my age, would, would he not be at the fault anymore either? She shakes her head. No, I do can. Haro certainly deserves some of the blame for what I became, maybe most of it. But personal responsibility has to come into the equation somewhere. I made my own choices. They were horrible ones, and I've accepted that. You should too. Lori pauses for a moment to collect herself. She looks haggard. Her pale cheeks flushed blood red. She swallows hard and presses forward. Anyway, one day, Haro invited me on a field trip to Stuttgart. Over the years of, at the Verstel, the commune has easily doubled in size. It was thriving, thanks to the efforts of Marta and girls like her. Haro would send girls into the neighboring cities to lure the street kids that nobody would miss. He targeted children because they were easy to indoctrinate and because nothing makes the adversary happier than the corruption of the innocent. As we drove out to pick up new recruits, I was already planning ahead. 
It was a foregone conclusion that I would pay my father a visit. The irony, a group of Kurtz Ritters getting immolated by a genuine servant of the actual devil it tickled me to no end. So when Haro stopped to fill up a diesel, I hopped out of the van and headed out on my foot to my parents' place. Haro wasn't overly concerned about my absence. I had long since reached the point where I could assert my autonomy, and he knew I'd be back. So I went up my folks' house and sometime around noon. I could hear the adversary whispering in my ear, telling me what to do. I'd long since learned to listen to its voice. It's always rewarded me with extra power when I did so did its bidding. It told me to knock, so I did. As the door opened, I could feel a torrent of flames welling up in the astral plane around me. It told me I was to channel into the doorway, into my father. So I did. But of the poor the person who wasn't open the door wasn't my father. It was my mother. As I watched her flesh blacken and melt, I heard her scream and broke into hysterics. I heard the adversary laugh. And at that moment, I realized that I was laugh that it was laughing at me. I'm sorry, Glory. Glory nods, a grim expression on her delicate face. Thanks. We're almost at the end now. Thanks for sticking with me. It was like a lever had been pulled. All at once, the bubble popped. I wasn't powerful servant of the adversary. I was not Haro's number one girl. I was a ridiculous little fool who willingly tied her soul to the worst thing in existence. Realizing all of this was one thing, actually fixing it was something else entirely. I knew that I had to get away from Haro, and that was the first thing I thing to do. Though I bit my lip and did my best to ignore the happy babble of the new recruits and trip back to first cell. I managed to get through the ride without screaming. Once we were back to the commune, I broke into Haro's safe, stole the commune's resources, and ran. I don't know when Haro realized I, what I'd done or whether he even cared. All I knew that nobody came after me, so I kept running until I got to Berlin. Getting past the wall is fairly simple. You know how easy it is to obtain falsified papers. The biggest obstacle that I faced was during the flight. Uh, was during the flight was the avatar itself. I could run from Haro, but how do you run from something that's tied to your own soul? Oh, God, glory! A haunted look of Glory's eyes heartbreaking. She gives you another curt, grim nod. So I walked to the office of the first street dock I could find, pointed to all the biggest, bulkiest pieces of cyborg they had in the display, and told them to put them onto me. He tried to upsell me on better merchandise, arguing that I was asking for was old and inefficient, better suited to be installed in a museum than in a body. He told me that I'd be shredded be shredding my essence and that was once that was gone I'd never be able to get it back. I stuck to my gun. After all, shredding my essence was the whole point. Glory looks up to you, her eyes sunken and hollow, and aura of loss about her was palpable. She looked like a woman and been through hell. That's all for now, Idukin. You've heard the tale, and now you know why I am the way I am. You know the things I've done and how much I have to atone for. If you still want my company, fine. If I've lost your friendship, I understand that too. But for now, I need to be alone. Oh, Glory, no. You've not lost our friendship. Oh. Alrighty, well, let's get this mission underway. Before we go, let's check on the Alice Fund. One last thing. See how much further we have to go. Alright, 21, 250 out of 50. Messages. All right. Let's get to the U-Bahn station and get this going. Earwig. 
OTK International is a small time software developer and it shows. The company's main office is crammed up against the back wall of a massive shared office park surrounded by competing businesses and other large corporations. A, a steady trickle of dead-eyed wage slaves flows in and out of the complex. The office park's main entrance is overflowing with hired security, but, you, but your forged keycard gets you past them easily enough. A few minutes later, you're walking into the winding corridors of the OTK International. You're only a few smash computers away from putting Amcel's plan into motion. Alright, give me a basic med kit. Let's roll. And here's where I'll say thank you all for joining me. I really hope you're enjoying this series as much as I'm enjoying making it for all of you. And you know I do because I just keep putting out videos. If you like this video, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and all that other YouTube stuff. It really, really helps my channel out and I would really appreciate the help. So anyway, thank you all for joining me, and I shall see you all next time.